Hey, that's Rose. Entrepreneur? You know, whatever that is. I mean, they had to explain what an entrepreneur was. Um, I then, after I got out of Yale, I was at, uh, went to Columbia Business School um, for my MBA. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Columbia Business School, there was nothing at Columbia University, business school or undergraduate, with the word entrepreneur in the title. No classes, no societies, no groups, no accelerator programs, no competitions, no nothing. So if you're asking how the entrepreneurship world has changed, the answer is it exists because there was back then as recently as, and I'm not that old, as recently <laughs> as my undergraduate career, there was zippo, nothing. And so you're looking at everything having effectively started uh, in the internet era. And that's one of the things that the internet has done, which is by, by nature of its expansive um, sort of alchemical composition of being the universal philosopher stone that can make any business uh, you know, scalable and growable and startable in your dorm room. Uh, it has enabled people who are latent entrepreneurs to actually start companies. Before that, you know, before the rise of the internet and the concept of startups, to start a company, you had to be you know, psychotic. I mean, you had to be so far down the entrepreneurial spectrum that this was a, a crazy thing and people would look at you and cross the other side of the street and you came down because you were this weird kind of person. Now it's sort of mainstream. So tell me how you got involved in this community. You know, what was your first startup and why you decided to change from a, so, a regular my, career? My, uh, yeah. Well, the actually I did. Um, yeah. my, I started starting companies when I was about 10 years old. Um, my very first company was uh, called Rose Productions, a multimedia organization. Um, my brother was a magician who did um, you know, children's birthday parties uh, as, you know, with his magic act. And um, I, of course, um, you know, informed him that he really couldn't be a magician if he was a performer. He had to have you know, business cards and handbills and posters and programs and brochures and headshots and so on and so forth. And luckily for him, Rose Productions, a multimedia organization, <laughs> Uh, so his headshots and business cards and <coughs> photos and, and uh, everything else. And business was very good for about a year until my one client realized that the sum total of his revenues equal to the sum total of my revenues. And there was a slight problem from his perspective with this engagement. So I lost my first client at that point. But that's when I started my first business. Um, and I then went on starting businesses in high school. In college, in high school, I started um, an after school uh, film program. Uh, I sold VX6 battery additive. Um, and uh, when I got to, uh, to New Haven, um, back in the old days, in a, in a prior century, where when you were on the old campus, the old campus actually had working fireplaces. Uh, so you know, working fireplaces, but what did they burn? They didn't work your firewood. So if you're a new student coming into Yale, where do you get, well, how do you get firewood? Right? Somebody had to supply firewood. Oh, a market hole. So I bought firewood wholesale and sold firewood resale. I had a whole, you know, I bought a quart of firewood. I had a truck pull up and, um, uh, you know, go to Chapel Street and you know, and Elm Street, and then we were, you know, you know, selling out firewood by this little small bundle and stuff. Um, then when uh, I got into to Pearson, I realized Pearson had a print shop. And mm -hmm. back in high school, I had been doing some freelance graphic design work because uh, that stemmed from the fact that I realized that <coughs> if my biology report had a really nice cover, it could often get a little extra half grade in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started doing work for other people, and then I got to Yale and realized that my college had, had this print shop there, except that the talk about entrepreneurship. The upperclassmen who were running the Pearson Press when I was at Pearson, I was a freshman at Pearson, were running it as sort of a uh, an offset letterpress job shop, competing on the QT with the um, the, the local Sir Speedy and the now Speedway and was now effectively Kinkos uh, or um, you know, FedEx Office, the commercial print shops in town, and they were sort of undercutting them with a little letter uh, offset press they had in there, and it was this big secret, so they wouldn't teach anybody or let anybody else in, so no other students could could get in. So um, okay, so then they graduated. Uh, and I found in my, uh, I think, sophomore junior year, uh, I was the chief printer of Pearson College. And um, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. But, okay, that's fine. So I got some books. And, I print. and then I started on, um, apprenticeship classes and started, ended up having 75 students and taught other people how to do it. Became mm -hmm. master of chapel of public college printers and chief printer of Pearson. So I was doing that as we were going along. Um, so, uh, you know, basically my entire, you know, entrepreneurial career was, you know, and, and my Yale career were, were you know, synchronous and, uh, and almost synonymous. So, uh, I, I watched an interview with you and you were talking about the Gutenberg Bible printer. <laughs> uh, I see a, a connection now because you are involved or interested in the printer. Well, it, indeed. So, uh, mm -hmm. what he was referring to is a TEDx talk I did for Columbia Engineering School 
um, about Johann Gutenberg as an entrepreneur. And it's an yeah. absolutely fascinating topic. And I was the first person, there, since, been, since my first TED talk, um, there have been a couple of people who've actually written books about it now, but it's absolutely fascinating. And if you want to search online for uh, uh, TEDx and David S. Rose, um, you'll see the video there, and I, and I trace through Johann Gutenberg's entrepreneurial career. I mean, his, uh, his friends and co-founders, his friends and family around, um, his, his angel investors, his VCs, all the way through, what he raised and how much, um, what he did. And, and here's an interesting little known fact. You know that, that Johann Gutenberg didn't publish the Gutenberg Bible? Um, no, he didn't. Because why? Well, because Johann Gutenberg was an entrepreneur. And what happens to entrepreneurs, everybody here knows, you are over time and you are over budget. Um, never been such a thing I've heard back in, since the dawn of man who was not, and so Gutenberg was, and so um, you know he had gotten his friend's family round, he got his VC round, and his VC was a guy named Johann Boost, who was a local business guy. Um, but Gutenberg had a really, which was a really great breakthrough kind of project, um, and so you know, the, he, and he had some page proofs, and so his, his VC sort of went along, and then he was late, and it's a big, you don't know how big Gutenberg probably is, this enormous thing, and uh, and so he was late, uh, and he was later, and he took more money, and he was almost finished. You need to get more money, and so his and so his VC actually had to go out and borrow money to fund investing in Gutenberg. And guess what? He again missed his deadline. Um, and so finally, his VC, you know, and history doesn't really tell us that this was a vulture capitalist, nasty VC, or whether this is a really good guy who's the end of his rope. I like to think as an investor, he was a good guy. But anybody who goes to Gutenberg and he says, "Johan, that's it. You had like seven extensions." I funded you four different rounds here. I had to borrow money. I need this back. And so, as happens occasionally when when entrepreneurial companies go bad, um, basically the VC repossessed the VC. You know, shut them down. Mm -hmm. Took all the took all the stock. Took the uh, took the, uh, the the Bibles. Um, and of course, what do you do when you do a takeover? You know, how, how do you provide um, you know re you know, reinforcements to get the staff to stay with you when you take over? You either do recruitment bonuses, whatever. Back then, uh, the best thing you could do was to he took Gutenberg's COO. Back then, they called him apprentices. Uh, a guy named Peter Schiffer, and he married him to his daughter. So, so, <laughs> so Peter Schiffer married Johann Fuss' daughter, and they reopened the business as Fuss and Schiffer. Um, and so it was Gutenberg's VC who actually published the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and so that's I mean, so we cooked this whole story with that. Anyway, sorry. Uh, no, that's, that's a great story. I saw you had a page. Did you buy that page? I actually, well, okay. so I, I, I made several different lives, one of which it stems, and both of them back from my days at Yale. So there's the entrepreneurial life over here, and then mm -hmm. my printing uh, life at Yale. So so here I was, you know, inherited this printing press, had no idea how to print, and here we had this wonderful letterpress shop uh, in Pearson. It was actually back in the bell tower of Pearson, mm -hmm. uh, in a converted squash store, which is very cool. Um, so I, I teach this how to print. So I got a book on, you know, how to print, except there were no, because printing, even at that point in the 70s, letterpress printing was, you know, anachronistic and was out of it, so there were no new books, so there were only old books, how to print books, and how to print. So I got one of those and read the book. I told myself how to print. Eventually got a college seminar in, in letterpress printing, a credit seminar, so I took that. Um, got some more books on how to print. Uh, and so effectively it was an autodidact when it came, for the most part, when it came to printing. So then in my senior year, I saw these posters around campus for the Ben Cinder Prize, which was a book, yes, book collecting prize. Um, and I said, oh, book collecting, what's that? Uh, oh, you mean all these books I have about printing in my room, you know, on the wall, maybe that's a collection. So I typed up the, all the titles there and I submitted it, and son of a gun, I actually won the Ben Cinder Prize, so I won Yale's Book Collecting Prize for the best book collection at Yale Senior, which is my collection of books on printing and how to print printing manuals. And that began a lifelong love of not only printing, which I still have, but of, of printing books and printing manuals. Mm -hmm. So when I got out of Yale, I got a press, and so I continued printing, and I kept getting more books, and I got more books. Um, and eventually, they filled the house, and they filled more of the house, and, when, and then, you know, and then one of those, you know, there were strange things that happened along the way, including like we, you know, we had to paint one year, so we took all the books down, so we paint the walls. And then when we went to put the books back, they didn't quite fit in there because books are sort of like rabbits you put in the dark at night, and, and two turn into four, and then turn into six, so they didn't fit there. So long story short, oh. Ultimately, um, I struck an interview here with the National Arts Club in uh, Manhattan. If any of you have ever been there, a really cool club. Um, and so I said, okay, I'll loan you my books if you loan me your space. And so um, so my library is actually now the library of the National Arts Club. I've got about 6,000 books um, on the history of printing and the, uh, the craft and, and, how to, and how to print. And I actually set up a whole letterpress shop in there as well. So I have several printing presses and we do all kinds of stuff there. So I still print, I still collect books on printing. And I, among other things, I got a Gutenberg Bible Leaf and a bunch of other things. Okay, I see the connection there as well between collecting books and becoming an author, possibly. Um, but we'll, we won't get to that right now. I want to ask you about how you founded your first tech company um, and the Wrist Mac, and how that turned into you know VC, you know got VC funding, and and, and then you became an agent. Well, for those of you who, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, how many of you 
did, whether, whether or not you knew the term entrepreneur, how many of you have felt that you were something different from when you were a, a kid or when you were in school? Raise, raise your hand. Yep. All right, that's like you know at least half of you over here. Um, so I, I am convinced that entrepreneurship is a spectrum. I mean, you originally just thought it was like a job, like you're an entrepreneur, you're a policeman, a fireman, or whatever it is. Um, I've been decided it's a spectrum, and people have, you know, range from people who would never in a million years imagine starting something to people sort of like me who have to go start something. Um, and then, you know, over time as I've taught entrepreneurship courses, then, you know, I figured the goal of teaching entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship courses <coughs> is to help move people along the line. So if you're terrified of it, at least you might be willing to work in, in an entrepreneur in a startup. And if you're working in a startup, you might want to be a co-founder. And if you're the kind of person who would start a startup anyway, now at least you can do it right with the right kind of skill set. Um, so, so, you know, given all that, um, I've been, you know, I've approached my entire life since I was 10 years old, you know, everything from entrepreneur perspective. So, for example, Back when I was at Yale, um, you guys have probably heard of mythical time in the past when there were you know, basses that flew and whipping poops ran, ran the world, mm -hmm. and there was something called bladder ball. Um, and so bladder ball, for those who have never heard of bladder ball, was a Yale tradition for many years, um, in where once a year uh, they would um, pull out a giant 10-foot canvas ball, a inflatable canvas ball, and drop it in the middle of the old campus at Yale, and then teams would buy to get this giant canvas ball back to their residential college. And it sort of started that way, and then it sort of get, get the cut to be a thing, and then it was the 60s, and then it was the 70s, and then you know all these teams would begin sort of early in the morning getting ready for this competition, and so they would start drinking Bloody Marys and screwdrivers, and so and they would of course have T-shirts for their team, and every college had a team, and the college had teams, so and then like the Yale Daily News had have a team, and the Art School had a team, and basically the chess team had to have a team, and so by the time you got to my time here in New Haven, you know everybody had a team. There were like you know. 75 teams, they all have t-shirts, and they all started off Saturday morning getting totally drunk um, before they, they went into the old campus to try and get this ball back to their thing. So you can imagine the idea of this giant 10-foot ball back in the middle of the old campus with about, you know, 4,000 drunken, crazy college students <laughs> running around the middle of the old campus, trying all pushing in opposite directions, trying to get it back to their campus. So that was clearly a recipe for disaster. So what would an entrepreneurial person do? An entrepreneur would say, hmm, okay, um, we'll come in when nobody's looking with a helicopter and pick up the ball. Um, so, of course, they could not bear forming a, a company, you know, the Pearson B-A-L-L, Bladder Ball Attack and Lifting League. <laughs> um, so, I gotta have the acronym. shares of, of stock in, in, in ball to my, to my uh, classmates um, to charter a helicopter to come in and pick up the ball. So, uh, and so everybody um, would, would get a photograph taken from the helicopter and get their piece of the ball and stuff. Of course, the other way, and having done that and raised money, we then, you know, I then gave a little more thought to it. Entrepreneurs occasionally go off a little bit half cock. And I realized that the point of this giant helicopter coming in over 6,000 <coughs> people in the middle of the old campus and dropping a piece of flypaper down to pick up the ball. You know, people pull the ball, they pull it down, the helicopter comes down, they're rolling really rolling, flies up with these heads. It would probably be a big disaster. I'd probably get expelled from school. It would be a good idea. So I said, okay, well, we have the helicopter. What are we going to do? So I said, oh, I'm running the printing press. Okay, so we'll work up um, propaganda leaflets. So using the Pearson Press, we print up all these propaganda leaflets saying, give up, go home. Pearson has one letter ball. Um, and then I actually managed to convince the master of Pearson College to come up with me in the helicopter. And so as Bladder Bowls in there, we actually flew over um, the old campus and you know, throwing out all of these leaflets saying, give up, go home, Pearson is one letter. Um, you know, the, the footnote to that story is that um, you know, here we are littering all this stuff out of the sky, but they instantly became collector's items, so everybody was grabbing them. And, and the, the Yellowhead police you know, you know, figured that uh, you know, you know, wait, somebody is doing littering all over New Haven. So they went around trying to figure out, but they couldn't find any evidence. And they had heard it was Pearson, so they went to the Pearson, the master was, and they said, you know, do you know who did this? And the master said, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Of course, yeah, as we all know about PR, um, if, it, if it isn't in the paper, it's not true, or in the news media. So I figured as long as I would go in the helicopter, this is back in the days before digital cameras and video cameras and videotape and everything else, um, you know, somebody had to document this. So I actually brought a film movie camera up there. And from the helicopter, I actually filmed um, bladder ball from the sky. Uh, and then as soon as the helicopter touched down at, at Sweden Haven, I raced off um, with the film to Channel 8 Television. Um, and I gave them the film footage for that night's news. And of course, I wrote the story to a company, Mr. Springer, mm -hmm. saying, you know, for the first time in history, a college has actually won bladder ball as Pearson successfully got the ball back to the thing. So that night, the you know, local television station <laughs> ran the footage, of course, with the story. And so we have proof that for the first time ever, a college actually won bladder ball. So anyway, so here <laughs> I was, um, so entrepreneurially thinking about all yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, and the question was, what does an entrepreneur do when you graduate from college? Mm -hmm. um, and so being a total opportunist, uh, had no particular idea in mind. Okay, something, something that happened. 
And so as I was graduating my, my senior year, I was debating between uh, joining Walt Disney World as an Imagineer to design rides for Disney World um, and getting a master's degree in type design at Florence. So as I'm sitting here thinking about this, uh, I get a call from Senator Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who I'd actually done some volunteer campaign work for, who was a friend of the family, um, and he said, uh, how would you like to come to work for me as my special assistant for urban affairs? Now, so happened that my degree at Yale was in special digital majoring in urban affairs. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. But, you know, entrepreneurs are you know, So my first job out of school was working for government in the public sector for Pat Moynihan as an urban affairs expert. And I had an enormous amount of fun as a you know 21 year old uh, fresh yelly um, out of um, uh, you know when they had been coming down and working for the center. Okay, one little story, and I, and I promise I won't do any animal anecdotes. So so I, I walk in my first day at the Dot Money's office, and I say hi, I'm David S. Rose, I'm the new special assistant. And the reception looks at me and says, "Are you Jewish?" It's a hell of a question to ask. I mean. Mm. I mean you know, I, I am Jewish, I'm sort of proud of it, but I mean, I wouldn't expect that to be the first question mm -hmm. I was asked my first day my first job, so I said, yeah. She said, great, okay, you're representing the senator, go to this address. Okay, fine, so I take this card, I go to the address, she was at Brooklyn, so I got to Brooklyn, um, and I find myself at Brooklyn Hospital, um, where they say, oh, you're representing the senator, yes, please come here, right, it's a modern person, I come in, and I'm stripped and put into surgical scrubs, and I find myself in the hospital operating room being the godfather to 18 male Russian adult immigrants who were getting circumcised as in honor of <laughs> So that was my first day on my very first job. I in the operating room watching eight adults get circumcised. Great. Um, very interesting kind of thing. Okay, so anyway, having, having um, worked for a couple of years from one hand, having an enormous amount of fun because the, the, the power, you know, senators, you know, they're there to deliberate policy in the Senate, um, but, they, but everybody thinks that, oh, they're an important person. So if you have a problem with your maid, you call the senator. If the street light doesn't work, you call the senator. If pot don't, you call the senator. So everybody calls the senator for everything, and therefore people assume that the senator can do everything. So I had for the free reign to do anything I wanted to do representing the senator. So I was writing op-ed pieces for the Times, and I was conducting congressional investigations, and whatever, and having a lot of fun. But I decided after a couple of years that I really, at heart, was an entrepreneur, this private sector kind of thing. <laughs> and I wanted to be like, the, the motive power of society. The, the government can only help to guide what, um, the, what society is doing, but the real engine of society is the private sector. And some people would like to be you know, the, the, uh, the navigator, and some people would like to be the helmsman, and some people want to be the engine. And I thought I was the engine. So I reluctantly left one hand um, and uh, went uh, to book Columbia Business School, got my MBA in finance, and at the same time, joined the family business, which was in real estate development, mm -hmm. um, and spent the next decade uh, doing real estate development in New York. Real estate is a very entrepreneurial activity. Um, but in terms of how much, and so, yeah, continuing to start companies along the way, so I started a company with my Columbia Business School math professor. It was actually one of the very first computer training companies, 1983, called the Computer Classroom. We were teaching people how to use these things <coughs> called spreadsheets. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but there's a thing called VisiCalc, yeah. and it was like the first spreadsheet, and, and um, you know, so I was actually beta site for Excel way back when, when they, when they did it. So, anyway, doing all that kind of stuff, and I was active online, so I, I got an Apple II computer when I got out of Yale, uh, and I was online on the original online before the internet, we did what knows a thing called the internet. So there were things like the source and CompuServe and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there were people, these bullet boards that you would, you would call into. Uh, and there were not a lot of people who were engaged in this sort of weird technical kind of computer, home computer stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got to know a lot of them uh, online. And then when the Macintosh came out in 1984, mm -hmm. uh, the next, a couple of years later, they had enough people who had Macs to have a trade show. So there was a Macworld trade show, and I went to Macworld, I had time back, of course, I went to Macworld trade show, and son of a gun, there you have these giant booths for Apple and Adobe and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and around the edges there were these little 10-foot booths for these companies, now we would call them startups, back then they weren't called startups, they were called little companies. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out <laughs> that I knew almost all these guys, because they were these guys who I had been hanging out with online, so they were all these early hackers who had started these weird little, little companies. Um, and so I was sort of jealous of them going having these little booths, but I was even more jealous when I realized that they got to go to the exhibitor parties, which I wasn't invited to because I wasn't an exhibitor. And they were the good part of that. I just got to go to the big zoo things for the attendees. So I said, okay, next year I'm going to be an exhibitor. So the next year rolls around and I decide to be an exhibitor, so I get a booth from Mac World, so now I have a booth, so now I'm an exhibitor. You will see the slight problem. I now have a booth, but I don't need to put it in the booth. So then I had to sort of back form it and say, okay, well, to, in the booth I need to have a product. Um, to have a product, I got to have a company. So that's how I back sort of into my, my first thing. So what, what am I going to put into this booth at Macworld where I really wanted to go for the parties? Um, and uh, about that time, I found in a remainder catalog, 
There used to be these things called catalogs, which were like websites. With <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, and, and you know, if you, your, your computers and tech went out of you know uh, out of fashion, they were remaindered off very quickly. Anyway, so I found one of these remainder catalogs, this digital watch that Seiko had developed that had a little serial port with 2K of RAM, two on one display. And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. So I know what I'll do. I'll take this and I'll get a cable made for the Mac, um, and I'll call it the wrist Mac. Uh, so uh, 28 years before the Apple Watch, um, I, I appeared at the Mac World Trade Show um, with the wrist Mac. Um, and it could you know, take the information from the computer and put it into your, into your watch. And it was really very cool. I mean, back then, there was a, a cartoon way back in the dark ages, even before me, called Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy had this, this uh, room, this television in his watch. And so, and so all of a sudden, this became known as the Dick Tracy watch. And so here I am, you know, somebody from Apple was overheard in the press room at the Mac World Show saying, you know, the most interesting thing here is that watch. But what a cheesy salesman. <laughs> it's dice, zip dices, and so on and so forth. Um, so Bill Atkinson, one of the original designers of the Mac, came over and bought one. Fred Smith, the CEO of FedEx, oh, wow. came over and, and got one. Um, so I had this hip prop in my hands. Um, and the problem is I only had nine of them left. So uh, you know, having sold them all, all my, my, my wrist Macs, I then went back to Seiko and said, hey, you know, um, you know, uh, you have you any more? And they said, well, yeah, but we're sending back to Japan to run under uh, bulldozers to avoid dumping regulations because the product was a disaster. So I got all the rest of their units, and we, we they basically put together a little little pickup team of um, uh, you know all these coders and, and hardware hackers and editors and stuff. And as a size, a little hobby, I created um, the wristback. So so that was our, my my first product, mm -hmm. which we actually sold. It became I'm pretty good at getting press, so it became this really big hit thing. It was in all the catalogs, it was all kinds of television shows and everything else. Um, now, but that was a product. I had that name for a company. So, being a sort of wise ass, you know, uh, you know, Yaley type thing, so I, I named the company Ex Machina. Um, mm. E X M A C H I N A. I mean, it's a multiple pun in two languages English and Latin, you know, Ex Machina, you know, formerly you know, Mac the Windows, out of the machine, the, you know, the, the business cards were the Michelangelo hand, so sort of the implied David and the God stuff. Of course, realizing that nobody really knew what the hell X Machina was meant, how to <laughs> pronounce it, how to spell it. Yeah. So our business cards actually on the back side had that entire paragraph saying, X Machina spelled this way, pronounced this way, derived from here, and so on and so on. Um, so hey man, so, so then we had this great hit product, we sold all them out. And then I wanted to do another product. So with the question, what's my follow-up product? So I got okay, I think I'll do a better wrist mac with more RAM and more this and more that. Uh, so I called Seiko and I said, you know, how much for a bigger, you know, can you design a bigger watch for me? They said, sure, no problem. You know, tooling costs, you know, about two million bucks. I said, two million bucks, tooling costs. I thought, well, no, um, that's not gonna work. So I said, okay, back to the drawing board. And just then Motorola introduced a wristwatch pager. Now all of you guys who have text messaging might not realize there was a thing called pagers, which were like the text piece of the text messaging, but actually the four text, there was just a number, a telephone number to put on your, on your belt. Uh, and they had developed one of these pagers that fit on your watch. It was a watch and a pager built in. So I said, okay, we'll do the wireless wrist back. Um, we'll OEM the Seiko, uh, the uh, Motorola watch, and we'll send messages back. So we figured out how to get into these um, uh, operator dispatch systems with the protocol that they used uh, so we could send text messages. Then we realized that the Motorola watch was actually a numeric pager, not a text pager. That wouldn't work. And besides, there were big clunky things nobody wanted. But just then, luckily, um, Motorola introduced the first text pager that would let you actually have, have text. And so we knew how to get into these text pagers because we had this protocol. So I, we created the first software that let you send from a computer a text message to a pager, which was really interesting. So um, Ex Machina now became a paging software company. Um, or as we would call it, a wireless messaging company or a wireless communications company, that, you know, depending on your, your terminology. Um, and the interesting thing was at that point, again, it's hard for people here to realize how the world has changed. Mm -hmm. The computer industry didn't know nothing about mobile, about wireless. I mean, there were no mobile phones, there were no PCS, there were no barely cell phones at that point. There was nothing. And so the idea of, of a, take a computer with a big thing your desktop, going, you know, take that mobile, that was wild. And the paging industry, of course, these were all the, the long story short, I actually, being a, a, a joiner, I join everything, so I joined the Paging Industry Trade Association, which was called Telocator. I got a message from them saying, oh, congratulations, you're on our technical committee, you're on, you joined us, you're on our technical committee. I was technical committee, okay. Mm -hmm. I walked the technical committee, and um, I walked into the middle of a fight between Motorola and a company called Glen Air, which made all the back-end systems for paging, mm -hmm. about a new protocol, so how do you get 8-bit data, binary data, into um, a paging system? Because uh, there was no protocol, because nobody had ever had an 8-bit data pager. No world rules were invent develop one. So um, they had competing proposals, and all the other guys in the tech company were these you know, RF radio wave you know, guys who didn't know from computers either, or protocols. So the group looks at me and says, well, you're a computer person, so uh, what should we do? 
So I said, well, blah, uh, blah, blah. They said, okay, great, you write it. So that's how I became the editor <laughs> of the page on industry's data communication protocols. Um, so I learned how to write protocols and long story short. Anyway, <laughs> so here we were as the experts in computer you know, wireless messaging. Um, mm -hmm. And the effect of that was fascinating in these early, early days because to the computer industry, we represented the wireless industry, mobility, the only people who could bring mobility to computers. And in the wireless industry, we represented the computer industry, the new world of computers. We were the, the linchpin between them and Apple and all these people out there. So it was a really interesting place to be in for like a guy with the three people on the company, you know, being the, the middle of the mobile industry and the computer industry. It didn't last for all that long. It was pretty cool while we were in. So any event, created this thing, created page and data software. We ended up doing the, the um, messaging software for all the various um, people out there. And, and, and uh, at this point, um, we had this software called Notify, which was wireless messaging software. Uh, and one day I get a call from a guy named David Corsi, who at that point I think was editor of, of PC Magazine, um, who said there's a new conference coming out called Demo, um, where we pick the 50 best products of the year and, and they demonstrate to potential buyers and so on and so forth. Um, it's in California, which I said, where's California? Because I'm a New Yorker. And um, you know, there's, there's Silicon Valley wasn't working his call back then. So I said, okay, fine, California, right. So I come out to California, no idea what I'm doing. And back then they have, um, the, so Demo, I said, Rick, anybody here ever heard of Demo? It's a, it's a major uh, computer conference in the West Coast. I'll put it on my agent Jacob. In any event, this was like the first demo. And the idea was you would demo your products to interesting people. So they had um, you know, uh, corporate buyers and they had press people and you'd get a little desk and a potted plant and a chair and demo and you would <laughs> demo your stuff. So here I was demoing it. I had people come over like Esther Dyson and Alan Patrickoff and John Doerr. Um, and they said, oh, it's a really interesting communication product you have here. Um, you know, uh, how much are you looking for? How much what am I looking for? How much money are you looking for? Ah, well that was the first time that I realized that actually people would be willing to invest money into a company that wouldn't have to be me. So I said, I'll get back to you on that, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, come back home to New York and then I tell my father, hey, guess what? Um, uh, you know, people are asking, they want to invest in my company, what, what, what do I do? Um, and my father says, they want to invest in my company, they're good. My, my father is a, is a total entrepreneur, but he's not at all a dickie. This, whatever this thing is, interesting. Well, you know, we have a friend who does that kind of stuff. Um, go, you know, go, go talk to Alan. And so I grown up with Alan. Well, Alan turns out to be Alan Patrickov, who at that point was the second biggest VC uh, in the world. So I, I, I go to, um, to, uh, to Alan and I say, here's what I'm doing. And people want to invest in me. And Alan says, well, you know, we, we're you know, Apex. And we do we have big later stage investments. But I do this thing called angel investing. And um, you know, I'll invest $75,000 in this, in this company. So, you know, never take the first offer, right? So I said, oh, great, thank you very much, I'll get back to you. So I get back to my father and I say, uh, hey, may Alan wants to invest $30,000 in the company, what should I do? My father says, that's pretty impressive. Um, we have another friend, so, you know, get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. and so go, go talk to our friend Lionel. Well, Lionel turns out to be a guy named Lionel Pincus, who was the CEO of the world's largest venture capital fund. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my staff connection, right? Uh, so uh, I went to see Lionel Pincus, who at that point is this wonderful courtly gentleman since passed away. He was in his probably 70s at that point. Um, so he hears my, my whole thing. Um, and he says, oh, that's, that's uh, very interesting. So, so what do my guys say? I said, I don't know. Who are your guys and what do they say? He said, well, I thought that's why you were here to pitch us. I said, okay, that's why I'm here to pitch you. So make a very long story short, Warburg Pincus ended up being my first venture capitalist, and I'm the only person to ever raise VC without realizing I was raising VC. <laughs> <laughs> I fell backwards into VC. They became my first venture investor. Um, at that point, the real estate world in New York had took a little, taken a little vacation, so I left real estate, moved full time uh, into, uh, into this business um, of this wireless messaging software. Um, and so here we are doing uh, all the stuff with all the major uh, carriers. We became the largest PCS uh, developer for the, uh, the new phones and so on. So for text messaging, SMS messaging. Um, but it was clear there was something on the horizon. You know, you've ever seen, seen Louis Jaws, you know, the short thump, 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 thump. This thing called the internet was coming. Thump, 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 thump. And it was clearly, we had dial-up software. Our, our software would pick up something called a, mo a, mo a modem, was a modulator, demodulator. Basically, was you connected your computer to a telephone line, and it would make a telephone call to another computer over there, and we'd go, bleh, bleh, bleh. Um, and it would connect up, and it would actually use audio to send computer bits across. Long story. Anyway, so that's what our, our software, like everybody else's dial-up software, did to connect to these other computers um, to send a message to a paging system. But this internet thing, the idea was you could connect one to the internet, and then somehow things would get routed around the internet. And so you wouldn't have to dial up and use software like ours to dial up into all these other kinds of things. So hmm, something was going to happen. What, were we, what could we do about it? 
So at this point, our company started growing, growing, growing. We had an idea. Hmm, how about we know the paging, right? We know those paging protocols, which we actually wrote. So how about if we license the paging technology chip from Motorola and we build this like data receiver that you can plug into a computer, and then we go to all these people who were starting these these things called websites that were these internet kind of things that were popping up, and we take all the data from these websites and broadcast that out over paging frequencies, which were like nationwide and had really good distribution. And this little receiver, they could take the stuff and put it into a computer, and you'd have a wireless internet broadcast network. Mm. So we thought that was actually a pretty cool idea. Um, and we're developing um, this stuff, we started showing it to people under NDA, um, and boy, oh boy, did people think this was a really cool thing. Um, so long story short, more venture capital started pouring and pouring and pouring in. We ended up, I don't know, getting to that point, like 30, 40 million dollars, 50 million, some crazy amounts of money for this thing. <coughs> we developed this the software. We ended up licensing it even before we launched to Hewlett Packard, Philips, NEC, um, uh, uh, Global Village, um, all kinds of amazing people. Hewlett Packard did a whole frog design branded version of this kind of thing. It was a it was a wire, the first internet broadcast network. We we take all this wire stuff for every website um, back in the in the day before uh, Seth Godin was a, a pundit. He had a little company called Yo-Yo Dine, and so we, he had it was his company and, and sports line and stuff. And so we take the data in, broadcast out of New York to global and internationally, nationally in the US, mm -hmm. we'll come into these little black pyramids that will plug into your computer and, and send it right into your computer. That was amazingly cool. The product shipped. It got every award in the book. Um, Walt Mossberg put a full um, whole column on it in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it won a dozen awards. It's in the Smithsonian as Breakthrough Technology. It actually came in second for the Cody Award for Best Software Product of the Year. Um, the first was uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer, and Microsoft actually changed the Internet Explorer so we could feed them wirelessly into the browser. The product ships, and nobody buys it, which is very depressing. Um, so here we had like 50 million bucks of venture capital. We had, you know, double. We had the end cap stuff in in uh, the aisles at you know, Comp USA. We had, you know, Malcolm Forbes that invited me, you know, invited me to, to lunch for, you know, you know, we were the new hot thing, and nobody's buying this product. I mean, and it was really, it was such a slick product. You wouldn't believe how cool it was. I mean, like amazing technology. Um, but you know, and at that point we had 125 people on staff, offices in New York and California, um, and sales. I mean, literally, you could swing about and not hit any one of our customers anywhere. <laughs> so the question, uh, what do we do? I, we tried everything. We, you know, I, I, we tried building into paperweights for stock book tickers. We tried putting it into, you know, doctors' offices for medical updates. We did nothing. Couldn't sell this. Um, so it was clear, <whistles> splat. Um, you know, you know, crash and burn. Uh, and so what do we do? Here we had all this technology. We had this whole data center in New York. So I go to my investors and I say, at this one we had all kinds of investors. We had um, uh, SK from Korea in us. We had uh, Semantic was in us. We had all kinds of people. So I said, okay, well that idea didn't work, but I got another idea. Um, <laughs> and so with wireless stuff, you know, this internet, we were, we were betting on one data channel and one set of, of software, we, of, of content we had bought and stuff. Um, how about if we just do a back end for this whole mobile wireless internet thing? We'll take data in from wherever it comes. Um, let people add advertising to it. We'll then turn it around and send it out in terms of SMS and text messages and, and pages, and we'll send it out in voice things and, and XML and so on and so forth. And so our investors looked at us and said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and so basically, we had uh, uh, most of our investors either said, "Okay, we'll we'll try it again, we'll refund you, you know, cram down 90 percent, you know, 99 uh, percent cram down over here," um, or they said, "You know, mm -hmm, go do it. Good luck with you." We had one investor. Long story short, forced into bankruptcy. Um, who she said, you know, I know who you are. You're not going to, you know, risk besmirching your name. You're not going to declare bankruptcy. I said, this is a legit shop. We, we tried it, did it, did it clean. Um, I have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, you know, you're all investors. Your venture capital funds. This is what you do. And they were really the give. They were kind of the one the exception out of a million that gives the bad name to VCs. And they said, you won't do it. I said, sorry, I will. Uh, they wanted to pay that in full. We didn't pay that in full. We declared uh, Chapter 11. Um, and the, because the last cash that had gone in was from Citigroup, which was one of our investors, and me personally as a bridge loan, a secure bridge loan. So we took the chapter company in Chapter 11, uh, bankruptcy, pre package bankruptcy. The bad VC got wiped out totally. And when we came out, Citigroup and I owned the new company, gone down from 125 people to 17 people um, with just our core engineering team. But there is a special guy out there who watches out for um, you know, entrepreneurs and others, you know, most of the children. And if you do the timing at this point, you will notice that we sort of went down in about 1998. We came up again in 1999, and we hit the internet boom. Ah, OK, 
okay, all of a sudden now, those patents that we had actually filed back you know, five years previously, they actually issued three months after we came out of uh, our Chapter 11 bankruptcy, um, and our patent portfolio was appraised at 120 million bucks by Press Order Scoopers, and we did a, we got a term sheet for a 60 million raise, 120 million free, and we're off the race again. Okay, so now, <laughs> We go out and we raise those company and we hire people and I acquire a company in the UK that serves as our base operations in, in um, England and then we, we set up offices in France and in Germany and we become this whole you know multinational you know company and then the whole internet boom we're the wireless mobile internet people out there um, so at this point uh, you know yeah, okay it's like the dog chasing the car what do you do when you catch it you know okay what do I know about running an international internet wireless whatever I don't know nothing so okay somebody better so long story uh, I went and found that the one the, the best guy in the space was the number three guy at IBM who would run IBM's whole pervasive computing group. Um, so I went and he was a Harvard guy, not at Yale, but I went and long story short, pulled out of IBM um, and like Mark Redman, a great guy, uh, and he left IBM, he was Lou Gerson's assistant, he ran IBM's mobile computing group, came in and took over as CEO of the company. I moved myself to chairman of the board uh, and took my first vacation in 12 years after doing this. Um, and so the company expands um, and uh, you know, then um, <clears throat> This time we got it right because instead of having you know, bet on one technology, one thing, you know, we we had cover all the bases. We could take any data in, any any data out, any network out, all these patent stuff. So the only thing that could possibly really hurt us is like you know what are the odds like the entire internet collapses globally mm -hmm. simultaneously with the whole mobile world crashes. No odds of that, right? <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> okay, the entire internet collapses. That was a fun time to be in the internet stuff over here. The second time around. Except this time, the entire internet went like under. I mean, to put things in perspective, for those of you who weren't living through this thing, Amazon lost 98% of its value. Amazon was, if some Amazon was 98% of value, the rest of us, <clears throat> and we're not a <laughs> uh, So this time, it's like, you know, chapter seven, ah! You know, stay through the heart of, you know, of this, this thing over there. I mean, so I, I, I volunteered to my, to my board to, to, to move to London, work without pay, the prime assessor day, but they finally said, no, put a stake in it. This is, you've done everything you could possibly do. You know, so that was, that was not a, uh, a, a, a fun time. Um, so, uh, you know, that plus the, uh, you know, in, there is a whole hierarchy of, of control in startups. You have the, the management team, you have the CEO, you have the investors, the chairman of the board. Then there's this thing called the spousal authority. Um, which is like the, the ruling entity. So that means the spouse of authority said, okay, you're grounded, no more starting companies over here. So I was unceremoniously pulled from the field, uh, as it were. Um, and uh, so during the, the you know, dot com, after the dot com crash, I've got no company, I've got no nothing, I can't start a company. Um, all I could do was actually come back up to New Haven, where I you know, back to my printing press the other, the other side of my life, and so I restored all the printing presses at Yale, um, to a printing course, I wrote a book about how to do printing, created a website that was the you know, Google top ranked website on letterpress printing, um, got the kids into college, and you know, was hanging out there twiddling my thumbs, when I got a call from um, the guy who invented social networking. Now, you, this requires a little rewind of time um, because I bet you didn't know that somebody actually invented and patented social networking. And it was a, a young entrepreneur in New York named Andrew Weinrich who in the mid 1990s um, invented social networking and created a, a website called Six Degrees, which was the first social networking site where you could sign up and I could sign you and, you, and then mm -hmm. you could tell your friend, you could traverse the tree and see who you knew. When this came out, I thought this was absolutely like amazing because it was, you know, I mean, I have no memory, I can't remember my own, my own name. On the other hand, my mother, who's now 85, can tell you everybody in her kindergarten class where they went to school, who they married, and how you personally know them. I mean, it's really, really sick kind of thing, right? So I was looking, like, this is like my mother in a box over here, this thing I can see. <laughs> so I it was so cool, so I walked down there, they were based in New York. So I, I, uh, I walked in the office one day and said, I want to be the CEO of this company. And so I hit me back, and it's like the Wizard of Oz. So I mean, the little kid, he's like, you know, like, like 24 at that point, or whatever it is. So anyway, so, so we, we become good friends. His name is Andrew Weinrich. He, of course, had the good fortune and the brains to sell his company at the absolute height of the dot com boom for 130 million bucks, um, which was very cool. Um, for 130 million bucks in stock. Um, so, uh, three months after he sold the company, at the absolute height of the dot com boom, or went under, uh, the company that acquired him shut, the shut six degrees down. And three months after that, the company that acquired him went bankrupt. So the guy who had invented that patent social networking is back in the street as another entrepreneur with no money and nothing and more ideas. 
And so, uh, by the way, the patents that he had filed are now that they were eventually acquired by Reed Hoffman, and they are the patents that underlie LinkedIn, in case you were curious. Um, so, in any event, um, so Andrew comes to me and says, okay, I've got another idea for a business. Let's say it's a wireless business. You're the wireless guy. It's a distributed Wi-Fi hotspot network, because everybody has Wi-Fi uh, in their homes, offices, whatever it is. So if we tie them all together, you have a sort of global universal Wi-Fi hotspot network. This is before 4G and everything else. I said, oh, that sounds really cool, but I'm grounded. I'm not allowed to do it. <laughs> um, so all I could do was to become an angel investor. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll fund you, and I'll write the business plan, and I'm chair of board, and so on and so forth. Um, so I got the company funded, and then I, then I got Nicholas Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab as the second angel investor, and so Nicholas and I you know, funded this thing. And, and Joltage was a, was a company that's called Joltage. It was the first distributed Wi-Fi hotspot network, a really, really cool thing. Um, we got it running, and it worked perfectly, and we actually got a, a term sheet uh, for a $4 million investment at a $10 million pre-money valuation, which was not bad at all for those times, from a Fortune 100 company. They would put in two and get a VC for the other two. That was the nuclear winter, but something you also haven't experienced here, in which VCs at that point had something on the order of $200 billion in their coffers, and they were not making any investments whatsoever because their LPs said, this internet thing just cracked and burned, don't you dare give us our money back. And the VCs said, well, I'm not I'm getting 2%, let me give my money, your money back. So they said, well, don't you spend anything. So they were all sitting there with these like, like bloated mosquitoes that suck all your blood, and they're sitting there, and, 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 and so, and so they had you know, $1 million in, in, in cash. They weren't investing anything, and I had a turn. We had, we had a great product, technologically exploited, wonderful thing, with, with everything working, killer port, killer the whole thing, a term sheet, could not get the second half of the budget for more money. So, Joltage went down. Okay, so now, let's see, I've lost money as an entrepreneur, I've lost money as an angel investor. You know, clearly, I was destined to spend the rest of my life as an entrepreneur and as an angel investor, right? Um, so, uh, uh, then, anyway, since I'm a joiner, as I mentioned before, um, as a, now that I was an angel investor, I joined the local angel club, which was, um, had been uh, created by the New York New Media Association, which was the trade group, sort of before Meetup, uh, there was a New York Media Association, there was a trade group of all the dot-com groups in New York, they had about 6,000 members. Um, at the height of the absolute boom, they had about 8,000 members. The only problem was when the dot-com crash came, you now had 8,000 members looking to the other 8,000 members for jobs, and there were no jobs, so that was not a particularly healthy organization. Um, but they had a, a angel investor program that would, uh, the people like Ashton Dyson and stuff would look at these deals on the side. Um, the trade association went bankrupt. Mm, okay, so bad times for everybody. Uh, but at that point, the only thing that was functioning was this angel group. So I said, okay, I'm an angel investor, so I'm an entrepreneur. So effectively, wrote a business plan, spun out the angel you know, group, created something called New York Angels, um, which was this a very highly functional group of angel investors. So I started angel investing at that point. I've been going out for about half a year. Let me stop with you. I have to go. We'll get to it. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and, so, and, so here I was. You know, uh, I, you know, so, so I'm, you know, I'm, I've started doing angel investing, um, investing in all kinds of interesting companies. This was a great day for angel investing because the VCs were not investing in anything, and angels were the only game in town. Mm -hmm. So you had really interesting companies, really interesting deals. And so we, when we, you know, I had nothing else to do. So I was, you know, we had really great organization stuff, we had great people, you know, you know coming in. Um, at one point, actually, on our board, our <coughs> virtual board members included uh, Josh Koppelman and Howard Morgan, uh, the founders of First Round Capital. Um, so at one point, a couple of years in, uh, Josh Koppelman pulls me aside and says, can I ask you a personal question? I said, yeah, what? He said, you seem a little overqualified and you're running an angel group. Why are you doing this? I said, I'm not allowed to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, then eventually I, I, I you know, flown into some, you know, back. Have anybody here know a book called The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil? I've heard about the singular, yeah. technological singularity, the next generation. Long story short, basically, a guy named Ray Kurzweil wrote a book about how exponential technologies are taking over the whole world, and so technology like Moore's Law is doubling, doubling, doubling every 18 months, and, and so where that goes, uh, and according to Kurzweil, where this goes is if you actually plot out this curve, um, the next generation is when computers and humans merge, and you either have computers with, you know, with, with, with human brains and souls, where you have humans who have you know micro nano you know bots connecting and repeating your brain and stuff, and so and computers design next generation of computers, and so when that happens, you know who the hell knows where things go. That's called the technological singularity because that's the event horizon. It, that the world would have changed so much by that point we can't see beyond it. So this book comes out, um, and long story short, it has three reactions to it. Some people say, well, that's ridiculous. Computers and humans are you know human exceptionalism. Computers never reach that over there. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Forget those guys. The next group of people says, okay, the scholarship's correct. We are heading that direction, but we're not that good as a, as a planet, as a, as, a, as a human race. Before we get to this technological singularity, we're actually going to blow up the planet, warm up the planet out of existence, whatever, you know, a nano cloud, suitcase nuke, mm -hmm. you know, so don't worry about the future because we're not going to get to there. Okay, well, if you're at least slightly optimistic and you're smart, so you're smart, you understand it's going to happen, it's not mm -hmm. optimistic, so you understand that you're going to get there. 
Then the question is that third group says, okay, well, what do we do about it? Because you know when Ray Kurzweil predicts that the, this technological singularity is going to occur when computers have now designing computers and is beyond our comprehension? 2045, less than 30 years from now, in the lifetimes of everybody in this room. And so if you really believe that that's when this is going to happen and we are going to be in this post-singularity world where all bets are off, that's a hell of a big thing to think about, right? So the third group of people who are the sort of rational, optimistic people um, say, okay, what can we do about it? And they got together, group people got together, including NASA, Cisco, Google, um, uh, Autodesk, Kaufman Foundation, all kinds of interesting players, and said, okay, um, we're going to create something called Singularity University and try and identify the best and brightest you know, entrepreneurs in the entire world, bring them together, um, and train them in all this advancing technology, and see if they can use this to help solve humanity's grand challenges so we can get there. And so this was done by Rick Kurzweil, who wrote the book, a guy named Peter Diamandis, who founded the XPRIZE Foundation. Um, and uh, long story short, um, I'm an associate founder of Singular University, uh, and when I heard from NASA of TED, I said, this is really amazing here. Who's doing the business side of this thing here? And they said, oh, you are. I said, oh, okay. So that's how I became the, the you know, founding fracture of finance, entrepreneurship, and economics at Singular University. So I spent the first three years, I actually created the whole finance and entrepreneurship program at Singular U. Um, and so I'm thinking about the future of the business. So now you put all this together, and let's see, we have an entrepreneur, multi-entrepreneur, multi-angel investor, multi-futurist thinking about all this stuff, um, and I say, okay, the world is so changing that the existing financial infrastructure for the world um, is not going to work. We now have in the total, well, every stock traded in America, all, and all the stock exchanges together, 5,000 equities. And yet in America today, there are over 700,000 employer businesses started every year. 5,000 publicly traded. 700,000 are created every year. So clearly the idea is to get public capital, tribute capital to fund the innovation, fund startups, that's not working. So something has to change. And so I said, okay, I think that there is a one-time need and opportunity to create a new thing which will be the infrastructure play for this entire new globalized world that has to come if you look at the future imperatives over here. So finally, I got permission from the special authority who basically said, get the hell out of the house and go do it. Um, so um, with a 15-year business plan to work on creating this infrastructure play, um, I started a company originally called AngelSoft because we started with Angel Software for Angel Groups. Eventually, we named it Gust. And so today, I am the founder and CEO of Gust. My day-to-day -day operating business uh, is building this infrastructure platform, which today um, powers over 400,000 startup companies for seeking funding, over 50,000 accredited angel investors. It's a globalized platform with uh, companies in over 190 countries. I didn't know there were 190 countries. Um, I'm still working in Antarctica. Uh, and we are, we are the official platform for the National Federations of Business Angel Investors in 28 countries and continents. Um, U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Scotland, Holland, Finland, Canada, Portugal, Russia, 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 Brazil, you name it. Um, and then because we have this kind of scale and size, we also now power the official online platforms for the cities of New York, Boston, London, U.S. Department of State. So we're building this entire infrastructure from the ground up, starting with local on individual entrepreneurs and eventually rebuilding this whole global platform. Uh, and so uh, to, that's sort of most of the, the gets to the present over here. So today, I'm Chair of Marist of New York Angels, I'm founder and CEO of Gust. Uh, oh yeah, then, right, sorry, along the way to get to why we're here, actually. Um, so about four years, three years ago, um, I got a call from a Wiley, one of the largest business book publishers, saying, um, the, uh, you know, this whole world of startups is really changing and it seems they're financed by these guys called angel investors and you're an angel investor and we looked around for somebody who could actually know something about the subject and we found that there's a website called Quora, um, I don't know if any of you know a website called Quora, uh, it's a question and answer website where anybody can ask questions and anybody can answer questions. Um, and so now since I think I know everything and I go and I answer your questions all the time, even when people haven't asked them, um, at this point, um, you know, my family and everybody else who knows me have gotten tired of my answering questions that nobody wanted to hear the answers to in the first place. But for us, there's this site where people ask questions and they want to know the answers. They want me to answer the questions. So I started answering questions. So at this point, I've answered like 5,000 questions on Quora about startup companies and angel investing, entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. And so why I found these things said, okay, well, you seem to know a lot about angel investing. At least you write about a lot of it. Could you write a book about angel investing? So I said, oh, okay, sure. So I think I took all my core answers, cleaned them up, and, and put out this book called Angel Investing, The Gus Guide to Making Money, Having Fun, Investing in Startups, um, which became a New York Times bestseller, and is now the standard textbook on how to be an angel investor. It's the best, best there is. 
not too hard if there are no other books on how to be an improviser. <laughs> <laughs> Put that aside for a second. Um, and so uh, First the movie reason it's a bestseller is because not only was it read by angel investors, all six of us out there or whatever, um, but entrepreneurs mm. started reading it um, to find out what the other half was thinking, what the person at the table was doing. Um, and so then a couple of years later, Wiley comes back and says, okay, we hope the entrepreneurs buying this book. Um, you think that you can write a book for entrepreneurs specifically about this thing. So I looked on Amazon, it turns out that there are you know, 93,210 books on how to start a company on Amazon. So I said, I don't think Burley's another, another book out there. Uh, and um, so I said, they said, go take a look. And there must be another, another edge you've got. So look around, and it turns out that all those books on Amazon, a whole, about half of them are how to start a small, a small business, you know, an American, typical American small business, your local, you know, hardware store, or hot dog stand, or whatever it is, you know, how to incorporate as a local Connecticut LLC and, and do whatever. And the other half were the ones from the newer books, you know, in this, this decade, Guy Kawasaki and Steve Blank, <laughs> Eric Reese, you know, how to do big companies, <coughs> high concept ones, you know, how do you find product market fit? How do you, you know, whatever, and, and so, there were actually no books saying, here's what you do. Here, and you you got to be a Delaware C Corp. Here's why. Here's how. Here's how you allocate equity. Here's how you set up your option plan. Here's how you monitor. Here's you know, all that. So I said, OK, that might be a, a, a one little hole in the market over there. So uh, we talked about it. I said, sure. So I did it. And so therefore, about four weeks ago, uh, we released the book called The Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business, which is all that nitty gritty how-to stuff about how to actually start a company. Uh, and that too now is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it's being picked up by a whole lot of accelerator programs as their sort of textbook. And so if you guys are starting a company and you want to know, you know, how to actually do this stuff, um, I highly recommend that it's available in, um, you know, hardcover, in uh, Kindle, uh, Nook, and audio with me doing reading, but not at this speed. I, for me, <laughs> it, it, takes, it takes an enormous amount of work and psychic energy and it drains me. But believe it or not, I can actually speak slowly and clearly, which surprises my spouse when I need to do it. It will practically kill me. But anyway, so the book is almost If you want to speed it up to get close to this. So that's so anyway, um, it's available wherever five books are sold, and Amazon and so on and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's my two books and my life story and what I'm doing now with Gust and uh, so because I was helped so much by so many people along the way, I have a very strong compulsion to pay it forward. And, and the question is, you know, how do you give back? I wish I had a lot of this. I had some great mentors, my father, Norman Lear, in, you know, investors early on, and I, and I benefited an enormous amount from that. So I try and pay it forward. But part of the challenge, the most constrained thing that I have is my time. And so I've got no time to do, you know, I probably get five to ten requests a day. You know, will you be my mentor or whatever it is? You know, and I would love to mentor, but been, you know, just no way I, that can be done. So what I do is what I try and call scale mentoring. Um, and so that's why I'm here doing stuff like this, you know, for the rich, you know, among, you know honorary you're paying me to, to do this over here. Um, you know, we can talk about doubling you know, that. Uh, but in, you know, in some way, you know, this, this is my give back. And so I'd be delighted to answer your questions, their questions, whatever. Well, look, I think you answered all my questions. <laughs> That was the easiest ever. <laughs> 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 okay, you're not going to get breath.